Hello, I'm Dr. Cindy Ward, and this is Step by Step, where we take practitioners through important veterinary conditions and issues step by step. Hyperadrenocorticism, also referred to as Cushing's disease, is a common endocrinopathy in dogs. As common as it is, however, I think all of us realize it can be a true challenge to diagnose. This algorithm will walk you through how to recognize patients with hyperadrenocorticism and what to expect on routine lab tests. We'll then talk about selecting and interpreting tests to confirm hyperadrenocorticism and how to differentiate dogs with pituitary dependent disease from those with functional adrenal tumors. This episode of Step by Step is sponsored by DECRA. So let's look at the algorithm we have and let's look at some clinical signs and historical findings that might make you think the dog has canine Cushing's disease. So first off, we're gonna start with the history. The first and most important thing is that you need to start off with a clinical suspicion of the disease. And that means that it's gonna have supportive historical or clinical signs that are very suspicious for hyperadrenocorticism. A lot of these clinical signs, and there are a lot of them, but a lot of them have a P in them. They either start with a P or they contain a P. So sometimes that's an easy way to remember all the clinical signs associated with Cushing's disease. So we've got frequent urination or polyuria. We have excessive drinking or polydipsia. We have ravenous appetite or polyphagia. We have decreased activity or lethargy. We have excessive panting. You might know a pot belly, thin skin. You might notice hair loss or recurrent skin disease, and you might notice muscle wasting. So these are clinical signs that are really gonna make you think, you know what, I think this dog has Cushing's disease. And as soon as you've decided that, then we can start putting that higher on our differential list, and then we're gonna be running some routine lab work to make sure that Cushing's disease still stays on our differential list, and also to make sure this dog will tolerate the medication that we may be using on him or her. So for a routine database, you're gonna run a CBC or a hematology, a chemistry profile or a biochemistry, and a complete urine analysis with a good sediment exam. Include on your hematology a stress leukogram, and we see increased neutrophils and monocytes, decreased eosinophils and lymphocytes, and an increased platelet count. And the increased platelet count can actually be pretty high. So don't be surprised if it is well above the reference range. On our biochemistry profile, we often see an increased alkaline phosphatase. Many practitioners feel that if the animal has a normal alkaline phosphatase, it cannot have Cushing's disease, but that's not true. Only about 80% of dogs have an elevated alkaline phosphatase. Other things you might see are increased triglycerides or an increased cholesterol. On urine analysis, often the dogs cannot concentrate their urine, so oftentimes the urine-specific gravity is less than 1030. They may have proteinuria, Usually it's not that high. Usually we're in the plus one to plus two range on a dipstick. But very importantly, you need to do a thorough sediment exam to look for any signs of an active sediment indicating a subclinical or clinical urinary tract infection. Other things you might find on a urine analysis are calcium oxalate stones, since excess cortisol can cause a calciuresis. What happens when you have an animal that's drinking a lot and urinating a lot, but you're not really thinking Cushing's disease and really what you want to do is rule it out? Well, we have a great test for that and it's called the urine cortisol to creatinine ratio. I don't think that many of you will be running this test very often, but if you do have that patient and you want to say, you know what, this is not Cushing's disease, then the urine cortisol to creatinine ratio is the best test to run. So let's talk about the confirmatory tests that we have in our arsenal to help us diagnose canine Cushing's disease. There are two of them that are out there, the ACTH stimulation test and the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. 
you really need to optimize your testing. So you wanna make sure these animals are as healthy as they can possibly be before you test them. So we wanna make sure that we've, we've cleared up any sort of pyodermas or urinary tract infections. And we've treated as many of the ancillary diseases that we can that these guys might have before we do any sort of adrenal function testing. So the ACTH stimulation test, while less sensitive than the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, it has a couple of advantages in that it's more specific if there's a concurrent disease. And really the only concurrent disease that should be present when you're doing adrenal function testing in dogs is diabetes mellitus. And so if you have a diabetic dog and you think this dog might have Cushing's disease, the ACTH stimulation test is the test to pick. The other advantage is it's short. It only takes one hour to perform. You can give the ACTH IM or IV. However, IV is usually more accurate. I would recommend using synthetic ACTH rather than a compounded ACTH gel because it tends to give more accurate results and that's absolutely accurate for diagnosing Cushing's disease in a dog. So with the ACTH stimulation test, what you're looking for is an exaggerated response to the ACTH that you're injecting. The reference ranges for the cortisols that you're gonna be measuring will vary depending on the lab that you use or if you use a point of care machine. However, what we're looking for is something that is above the normal level that you would see when you inject ACTH. The other confirmatory test we have out there is the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. And this has the advantage in that it's the most sensitive of the tests, meaning that if you have a dog with canine Cushing's disease, you're more likely to pick up the disease if you run this test. The disadvantages of it are that it's probably not as specific, meaning that if you have a diabetic, then you're, you have a higher chance of getting a false positive using this test. But otherwise, it should be your go-to test. The other disadvantage of this test is that it is a full eight hours. So it takes eight hours to run. And during that time period, the dog really has to sit in a cage except for some bathroom breaks because you don't want him or her getting excited and running around. You really need to have him at sort of a baseline, stable stress level. For the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, the question that we're asking is whether this animal can suppress the adrenal axis over an eight hour time period. So what does that mean? That means that if you give dexamethasone and you try to wipe out cortisol production, a normal dog should be able to do that over eight hours. In an animal that has hyperadrenocorticism, we will not see suppression at the eight hour time point, meaning that the cortisol level at the eight hour time point will be above the reference range. And again, your reference ranges are gonna be different depending on what lab or point of care machine you use, but they will be above the reference range. So what do we do now that we've diagnosed Cushing's disease in the dog? Well, it is helpful to actually be able to tell whether the animal has pituitary dependent disease or a functional adrenal tumor causing the disease. And there are several reasons why you may want to know this. One is that it can change your treatment options. If you have an adrenal tumor, that opens up the treatment option of surgery to remove that tumor. But even if the owner said, you know what, there is no way I will ever do surgery, knowing whether or not the disease is coming from an adrenal tumor or a benign pituitary tumor helps you determine how to treat the animal most effectively, but even more importantly, it helps you determine the disease progression. In that if you have an adrenal tumor that happens to be malignant, the disease progression may be quicker and you may require higher doses of medication to get the clinical signs under control. There are a couple of ways that you can identify pituitary versus adrenal disease. One we talked about with the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, we run a four hour time point, And if you see an initial suppression of cortisol and then the animal escapes suppression at the eight hour time point, that is consistent with pituitary dependent disease. You can also run an endogenous ACTH level. You have to collect the sample on ice. 
and it has to be frozen at minus 20 degrees before you send it off to the reference lab. If the number is very, very low, it is an adrenal tumor. If the number is very, very high, it is pituitary dependent disease. The next thing that you can do, which many people in practice do because it's a lot easier to perform, is an abdominal ultrasound. If you have two enlarged adrenal glands, that is absolutely consistent with a pituitary tumor. If you have one huge adrenal gland and the other side is atrophied or very small, then that is supportive of an adrenal tumor that is producing the cortisol. The other thing that you can do, which most people don't do because it's expensive and it requires anesthesia on the animal, but you certainly can perform a CT or an MRI. And what you would be looking at there is a functional pituitary tumor causing the disease. So with that, we've gone through the historical and clinical finds that help you zero in that the animal may have Cushing's disease, routine database findings. Then we've talked about how to confirm that disease in your canine patients. I hope you found this algorithm helpful to guide your diagnosis of your next Cushionoid patient. Thank you to DECRA for sponsoring this episode of Step by Step. For more information on hyperadrenocorticism, check out vetfolio.com or use the on-screen QR code for additional tips about Cushing's disease from DECRA.